Colonel Lee Gentile, your chapter in the new Army Press anthology on Eurasia deals with Russia and the way its nuclear arsenal has shaped its recent moves in Eurasia specifically and some other places um, more, more generally. Can you give us a general summary of your argument in your article in the, in the anthology? Geopolitical uh, issues that are going on inside the greater Eurasia area and what I was seeing over the last few years, particularly when you're looking at Georgia, Ukraine, Syria, is a lot of discussion about new generation warfare uh, in the little green men, if you would. Uh, hybrid warfare hybrid as well, warfare. some people call it that. Right? Yeah, yeah, hybrid warfare. But there was a lack of overt communication or discussion about nuclear weapons. Right. Uh, knowing that Russia has the largest nuclear arsenal in the world, I found it, I found it odd. But okay, it, now are you a Air Force officer who spent time in the nuclear forces of this country? N no. Matter of fact, uh, my specialty is in close air support. Okay. And that's actually where my interest started. It, when Russia got involved in Syria a couple of years ago, the first thing I noticed was that they were not doing close air support with the, the Su-35, which would be equivalent to the A-10, okay. which you normally expect to see in a close air support fight. Right. Instead, we started seeing uh, Bear bombers, Blackjack bombers, Su-24s, uh, things that you would you know, you would normally see with an air interdiction type fight or in a battle where there was a significant enemy air defense system. Well, there was, that didn't exist for the Russians. They were operating in Syria at the behest of the Syrian government. Right. They, they were not, their forces were not threatened. Uh, I, I found it odd that they were using uh, their sea-launched cruise missiles. I found it interesting that they were using their air-launched cruise missiles off of their bombers, and I didn't fully understand why until I did some research and realized that those airplanes are capable of nuclear weapons, okay. employing nuclear weapons. So yeah. I found that odd, and I started to peel back the onion regarding the Russian nuclear forces. And what I found was that uh, as Russia has started to reemerge as a global or regional power, if you would, it is struggling with its budget. And as a kind of a strategic umbrella, they are relying on their nuclear forces in order to essentially protect their conventional operations in order to advance their, their interests. And uh, as I continue to look into it, I realized that what the Russians were doing wasn't just there. It, it was spread throughout every operation they had done from really from Georgia on. In, in all these discussions of hybrid warfare and new generation Correct. warfare, you know, that, that a lot of us have heard about, you don't hear a lot about nuclear weapons or nuclear strategy. So this is pretty interesting what you're talking about. Well, you're not hearing it from our side, but you are hearing it very overtly from, from the Russian side. Okay. You're seeing it inside their doctrine. In, uh, in their 2000 doctrine, the Russians specifically say that they would use nuclear weapons in a massive conventional attack. If, if another conventional force attacked them, they would consider using nuclear weapons. I thought that was interesting. Then to I started, say the least, it's interesting. That's right. Then I started to see that they were, every time, when you look at Georgia, just prior to starting the operation in Georgia to take South Ossetia, they put their strategic rocket force, their nuclear force, on high alert. This is in 2008, the war between Georgia and the, Ru the Russian Federation. That's correct. Okay. Then you see the same thing again with when Crimea went down. You saw the strategic rocket force go back on high alert. Then you started to hear and see these overt use of the strategic forces. You started to see uh, nuclear-capable submarines popping up in territorial waters of European nations. You started to see bear bombers and blackjack bombers doing flybys, getting in very close proximity to the air defense zones of, your, of these European nations. It was... What I have classified, because I could not find a better term, but I call it nuclear coercion. Okay. Can you describe that a little bit more? What, is, sure. what do you mean by nuclear coercion? And so coercion unto itself, the definition of coercion is that you're going to hold something at risk in order to achieve an objective. Okay. Well, in the case of the Russians, their biggest concern is the West's global precision strike capability. They're very fearful of that. And what they've had, to, what they've realized is that 
until recently, they haven't had the conventional capability to counter it. And so they've been relying on their nuclear forces to do just that. Okay, so let's take a step back. And this is interesting because in 2008, relatively small war between Georgia and the Russian Federation. Not a, the West knew about it, but did not really threaten to intervene in any major way. A lot of discussion of that. But correct. you're saying that in that small scenario, they had their nuclear forces at the ready. That's correct. So when you really, when you start peeling that back, you, ha you have to go back to 1999 and the Kosovo operation. That's really what I see as probably the most significant turning point with regard to Russian strategic thought. Okay. Uh, the Russians did not want the West to intervene in Kosovo, mm -hmm. but we did because of our interests there. Well, that caused a lot of concern for the Russians. They have a deep-seated fear of invasion. And what they saw is that was encroachment upon their natural buffer zone. Shortly thereafter, 2000, less than a year after Kosovo, you see an overt statement from Russia, their strategic communication saying, if they are attacked by a massive conventional force, they would be willing to use nuclear weapons. Seems very odd to us in our current construct. Yeah. But if you go back to the Cold War and you really start to examine U.S. nuclear doctrine during the Cold War, you'll find that we were the ones that actually developed that type of strategic thought. Okay, so small conventional force, forward positioned in Europe with a larger nuclear force backing it up? Is that the idea? That's correct. Okay. So after World War II, obviously Europe was destroyed. The number one priority was rebuilding Europe and rebuilding the European economy. Every dollar had to be spent on the economy. We could not afford a ma massive militaries in order to counter the five million man Soviet army. So what the decisions were made inside the political, the, the Western political spheres is we're going to have a small, highly trained, credible, conventional force that will be backed strategically by nuclear weapons. You've taught, I think, in your article, I, I remember this, that there's a cultural difference as well here between how the U.S. and its allies see nuclear weapons and the use of them and how the Russians think about them. How is that tied to what you're talking about? Certainly, a lot of that has to do with how we, how we look at war theories and how we war game. So as I mentioned, the U.S. and the West had a similar, had a similar theory called counterforce. So most folks are familiar with mutually assured destruction, right. which is right. if you launch a nuclear weapon, I'm going to launch one, <clears throat> and we're going to destroy each other. But there were other theories that were out there. One of them was this, this theory of counterforce, which is if, I, if you invade me with a large conventional force, i.e. the Soviets coming across through the Folder Gap, my conventional force will be able to stall you, but I would need to use small, very small yield nuclear weapons against your military forces only. I wouldn't go after your industrial centers, your population centers, or your government centers. And we, we had tactical, what they called ta tactical nukes at That's the time, correct, right? and we still do. Right. But what happened, what we realized in our war gaming, and this goes to our culture, is our war gaming was somewhat scientific. We realized that if I used a, a tactical nuclear weapon against your forces, that you would most likely retaliate in kind, and then it would quickly escalate. escalate right. Every war game we did, every scenario we ran through, ended up in global nuclear war. Now, when you look at it from the Russian perspective, they're seceded in, in Soviet beliefs and looking at the West's kind of adversity to casualties. And they believe that the Russians believe, based upon our kind of adversity to casualties, that they could use a tactical nuclear weapon against our conventional forces without a risk of retaliation. Because that would lead to the escalation, that right. would ultimately end up with Western powers taking huge casualties? Is that Correct. Okay. Because really what it comes down to, in order to, if a nuclear weapon were used, in order to stop a global escalation, yeah. somebody has to stop. Right. The Russians believe that we would stop. And they would have the advantage at that point. Correct. Okay, interesting. Right. Uh, well, and, and, and that is a gamble. They're, that is their assumption that we would stop. It's tough to say if we would, but they are gambling. Now, that is, again, to keep our conventional forces at bay, because the, the thing they want to prevent is an invasion of the Russian homeland. So 
In what ways do you think the Russians would consider using any level of nuclear weapons uh, to prevent, let's say, NATO defending the Baltic Republics or Poland or other parts of Eastern Europe? Is, do you think that's in play? Tough to say, but uh, what you've seen over time is, again, I said that overt discussion about the use of nuclear weapons was in 2000. Since then, several uh, Russian strategic documents have come out, and they have removed that wording. Now, I don't, I, I don't think they've abandoned that right. thought process, right. but as their economy has recovered and they've been able to advance some of their own conventional capabilities, particularly when it comes to the air defense networks, I think they believe that they have achieved closer to a conventional parity with our global strategic conventional strike capability and don't have to rely on those overt nuclear threats as much. But as you can see, as recently as the, the Ukrainian conflict, right. they are doing it at least covertly. Okay, and that, that was my next question because your article does, I think, at least mention that with when the Ukraine crisis broke out in 2014 into 2015, yes. It, it came along with some nuclear saber rattling from the Russians. True? Absolutely. Okay. What what form did that take? Uh, there were there were several. The first off, as I mentioned, was the putting the strategic rocket force on high alert. Uh, but then you also saw other things, such as the leaking of uh, nuclear tipped uh, uh, torpedoes. Uh, you saw flybys of nuclear capable bombers. You saw nuclear capable submarines popping up into territorial waters. Some of these things were, uh, they seem somewhat innocuous, and when taken as, as singletons, right. uh, they really don't mean anything. But if you look at them from a broader perspective and link them together, you realize that this is that continuation of that overt threat that was made in 2000, just done somewhat quietly. And in this case, in this context, it was the Russians telling the West, we're going to do what we're going to do in Ukraine, and we don't expect any intervention from you all. Is that, is that right? That, that's essentially what they were saying. Is that they're, they're forcing into the West strategic calculus, is it worth it? Is South Ossetia worth it? Is Crimea worth it? Is the risk as far off as it could possibly be, as you say, the, the potential of a nuclear strike seems very, very remote, but is it worth the risk? What is, what's our response been to all of this, besides thinking it through and analyzing like you've done? Sure. It's been, for the most part, it's been across the, uh, it's been across our, our global uh, di diplomatic information and economic uh, sources of power. Okay. Some from our military perspective, it's not that we've been, uh, not that we're not doing anything, but it's been more in the way of shows of force. Mm -hmm. It's been more in the way of exercises to say, hey, we don't like what you're doing. By the way, we are a, a credible, uh, we are a credible conventional force, and we want you to stop. But when you really, you start peeling back the last uh, 20, 30 years, really all the way back to the Reagan administration, and you start looking at what were the things that we've done over time that the Russians and the previous, the Soviet leadership, really was fearful of. The most significant one, which is part of our damage limiting theory out of the 1950s, was the development of an anti-ballistic missile shield. Mm -hmm. Started off with what most people commonly refer to as Star Wars. SDI. Or the strate yeah, Strategic Defense Initiative. Right. That has moved forward as we've, as we've advanced Patriot. Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense, the FAD. And any time that we look at deploying those ballistic missile assets anywhere near Russia, whether that's in the Pacific with regards to China, or sorry, regards to Japan and South Korea, or in Europe when we're looking at some of the former Soviet bloc countries or Turkey, mm -hmm. Russian and previously the Soviet leaders have been very, very overtly opposed to any sort of action that would essentially neuter their strategic capability because their strategic rocket force is that umbrella that protects them. And if we take that away from them, they've lost their, their leverage on the international front. And so as we're going forward, 
we that needs to be a major part of our political actions as a as the U.S. and the West. We need to make sure that we are being overt and maybe even somewhat threatening with regard to the deployment of those forces. This anthology is about Eurasia, obviously. So, what does this all say about this concept of Eurasia and Russia's emerging power or the sustainment of Russian power in that? Eurasian area. Sure. Now, I, I focus a lot on my in my paper, uh, my, my chapter, about the conflict between Russia and the West. Mm -hmm. But really, from the Russian perspective, you have to look south. You have to look at China. And in all reality, with a 2.3 million man army that could walk across the border, that is actually the greater threat. You talk about the Chinese army being that's correct. Yeah. Right. yeah, so the, the Chinese army is actually a greater threat to Russia than the Western armies are. So is even though those conversations tend to be between the Kremlin and the West, there is certainly a message that is being sent to Beijing as well, because that is part of that greater you know, Eurasian landmass, if you would. Now, from a perspective of an individual growing up. Yeah, I was taught that you know Europe was a continent and Asia was a continent. Well, that was because of the geography. But modern technology, airplanes, infrastructure, uh, you know, transportation, has essentially bridged a lot of those gaps. And as we, if you look at on a map, you look at Eurasia as a landmass. You realize that it's Europe, Asia, China. The Middle East, as we would think as separate areas, they're not. They are they are connected right. in the importance of that area, whether it's population, resources, uh, et cetera, is growing. It's an interesting comment because over the last, last century, the 20th century specifically, uh, relations between China and Russia and the Soviet Union have been good and bad. They've cycled through these periods where several decades they'll be friendly and then they'll have a break. And it's, it's very antagonistic between the two powers. So with that history behind them, how do you think that shaped this idea of Eurasia going forward? Sure. I think uh, left into themselves, Russia and China would, pro would probably continue to have an antagonistic relationship. But as you bring in an offshore balancing power like the United States, Western countries, you, you have this, th this potential for a bonding of the two. And when you look at the... Uh, not just the physical size of the two countries, but resources, economy, uh, population. I, that is That would be a significant strategic challenge for the U.S. and the West going forward. Now, what you're, what you're, I think you might see here over the next at least 15 to 20 years is depending on the ability to collaborate between the, the, the West China and, and Russia, we see, uh, you could see them grow together as they look at common areas of interest like the Middle East. It's solving Middle East, you know, the, some of the issues that are there because all three areas, uh, all three major players have some sort of interest in the Middle East. Same thing along with some of the peripheries when you're talking trade routes, access to resources, et cetera. Uh, China is involved in Africa. That's China right. is involved in Latin America. The Russians are now uh, making moves in Latin America. So you see the, these powers reaching beyond Eurasia. Certainly. And I would say you could take that back to what we saw during the Cold War back in the 50s and 60s, where you had the Soviet Union reaching into Central and South America, or more importantly, tied directly to Cuba uh, with with that economic, military, political support is more of an you know, a offshore balancing of powers, if you would, in order to try to maintain a bipolar, or in this case now, a multipolar world. Sure. Very interesting discussion. Thank you very much, Colonel Lee Gentile.